Yes. Okay. We're live now. We're recording. Awesome. Thank you, Marianne, for having the patience to sit with me while I get this technology figured out. Uh, That's okay. That's why we still need people. It's a good thing to know that we cannot be replaced by machines. We can't. We need each other. It's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my motto this year is connection. I do a lot of things online, and I decided that I needed to get in front of other people, like talking and having connections. So uh, it's been a really good year. Um, so first thing I want to say is I connected with you through the uh, group Old Chicks No Shit. Yes. <laughs> of which I'm it a part of. Do. Oddly enough, I got to that space where I'm in a group called Old Chicks No Shit, but that's okay because I'm happy to be in my 40s. Um, but um, I just sort of saw something that you posted in that group. And then I thought, oh, she sounds cool. I want to interview her. But the more that I got looking into your YouTube and everything else, I was like, you are super cool. Uh, way cooler <laughs> than I will ever be. And I'm so happy that we're sitting together, all to say. So um, I want to go right back to the beginning. How did you get into acting? Uh, well, gee, let's see. I got into acting. I, when I was a little, little girl, I used to love the Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah. And I knew all the little songs. Today is Tuesday. You know what I mean? I mean, I know all the songs still, probably by heart. <laughs> and um, I was born in 1948. So when I was watching the Mickey Mouse Club in the 50s, there were not a lot of people of color on television. And Annette Funicello had olive skin and curly black hair, and she was closest to somebody who looked like me on television. And I thought, I want to do that. I mean, I had little mouse ears and everything. I didn't really know much other than I was always a very extroverted kind of kid. And I always had was making up stories and things like that in my head. So I think I'm a natural born storyteller. And I'm pretty much an extrovert. And my belief is that if you have a desire to do something, it's because God, the universe, divine intelligence, whatever, has equipped you with the abilities to do that. Uh, and so I discovered Carl Jung in college because I thought, well, no one else in my family is in show business so <laughs> i was kind of like an it took me a little while to come out of the closet as wanting to be an actor it's like no you go to college and then you get a real job this is not a real job but i i discovered carl Jung, and i realized that i was genetically predisposed that i had a good i had a good uh, um skill set to be an actor and then that's and then i and i had the desire so obviously this is what I was meant to do. So I just followed it, even though it seemed to go against uh, traditions. I, I started acting uh, in college. I toured with the Southern Illinois University Touring Theater. And then when I graduated from college, I have a double major, both theater and journalism. I started out in public relations. And I did that for three years. And then I was working at the ABC Network in New York. And I was married, I was pregnant, and I went on maternity leave. And while I was on maternity leave, I auditioned for a children's theater company. And I got in, and I never looked back. <laughs> and, my very, and my very first paying job uh, was in uh, for the parks department of the city in New York, and it was seventy five bucks a week, and all you could beg in the street. So I, <laughs> really, we would pass the hat and though then go to a Chinese Cuban restaurant and write the script for the next week. We literally did it off the side of a truck, and we would wow. go to all the different parks. And, and so I was hooked. Once I thought of it, they paid me. I'm legit, and I just from there I followed my passion. I am an actor. I've been paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I never was allowed to watch the soap operas as a kid. Um, 
I don't really know why, because now they're pretty tame in comparison to TV these days. <laughs> but at the time, I think my mom thought they were a little too racy. But I do remember The Edge of Night and Another World was the other one that I remember. But uh, so when I saw that you had been in that, I thought, oh, how cool. Like, how long were you in uh, that show? Um, I was cast on The Edge of Night in 1981, and I was on that show till it went off the air in December of 1984, right? Oh. 1984. Oh, yeah. And um, so I was on for three and a half years, and which was a nice long run. And we have a lot of fans who, through a lot of YouTube videos, because after the show went off the air, I think maybe a couple of years later, USA, the USA Network started running the uh, reruns of the show from 19, I think from 19, about 81, right about the time I started. And so we now have a lot of fans on Facebook and Edge of Night Facebook groups. And really? And sometimes they're watching the old videos and they comment on them and it's, it's, it's fun. That's cool, actually, how it regenerates itself. And some people remember the show from then, and some people weren't even born when it came on. <laughs> They're watching the shows now. That must have been a hard gig every day, all that dialogue and learning. And um, no, it was a half hour show. Oh, was it okay? Yeah, it was a half hour show, and even that, I'd say, although my audition scene was twelve pages of dialogue, it's it's like any other muscle. You keep doing it, and I'm on my phone, so are you still there? Okay. Yeah. I'm I don't know how to. Sh I am not really technical, so <laughs> <laughs> calls may come in, and I'll just turn them off. There are so many technical things that I, you know, I don't know at all either. That's for sure. So uh, as time went on, you uh, got to act with Red Fox and Della Reese. I loved Della Reese and Touched by an Angel. I used to watch that show tons and tons. Um, how was that working with those guys? Okay, the sound is a little bad, so I missed the question. What is the question? What was it like working with Della Reese and Red Fox? They were the best. I mean, they were, they were just the most lovely, gracious people. Uh, it's been my experience that the bigger the star, generally the nicer they are. Uh, if they've come up through the ranks, I, I've never met a really big star who had a funky attitude. They were just loving and gracious. Anybody who, who's worked in the trenches, they admire hard work and they, they consider every actor their peer. Yeah. There was some of the, and they were just delightful and giving it. Red used to say at the table read for the show, because we would have a table read before um, each show and then we would block and everything like that. And he would, he would turn to the writers and say, why do I have all the damn lines? These are, give these people the line. I'm already a star. Make them stars. I mean, he was wonderful like that. So uh, what was it like to be on a black show? That must have been cool. I'm sorry, what was what? What was it like to be on a show? Like it was, a, 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 I guess, I never really saw the show. I don't know why. Maybe in Canada it didn't play as much or something. But was it at all black cast? It was, and it was... Uh, a CBS attempt to build a show around a, a, a black family. We came on, we were on in 1990 to 1991. And during that time, Red Fox died. And so we weren't sure if they were gonna continue with the show. And then they brought Jack Kay in to play Della's, to play my sister and Della's other daughter. And we continued on for eight more episodes after that, and then they canceled the show. Oh. Interestingly enough, with the way audiences are segmented now, if that show was on the air right now, it would be a huge hit. I think we were pulling something like 13 million viewers a week. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now shows would be happy to have that, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so tell me about, I, I only have about a half hour and we've done a lot of time on Facebook and stuff. So I, I really want to know from a mindset point of view, your progression through life, because at some point the acting stopped 
And then we talked about this uh, before about how you then transitioned into a new career that wasn't for you at all. Okay. So well, talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, the acting, the acting didn't stop. I didn't stop acting. They just, the casting directors just stopped calling. <laughs> so, so um, because I had outgrown my ingenue leading lady status and was mm. going more into the character world. And uh, in fact, my, my agent at the time said, suggested that I gain 50 pounds so I could do more character work. Uh, and I thought, I'm not going to jeopardize my health, high cholesterol. I already have high blood pressure. No, I don't think so. Uh, not only that, but it was playing into a certain stereotype that I don't believe in stereotypes. I think people should be people. And there's a diversity in, in age, ethnicity, uh, body type, and that all of that should be represented on television. So once they stopped calling me, I, I think actors have a natural curiosity about human behavior and so I spent a year in training to become a hypnotherapist and when I was seeing my clients that during my residency I was assigned a lot of women my age who were going through midlife crises and I realized by working with them that it wasn't so much that I, and then a lot of them were depressed. And it wasn't so much that I had to hypnotize them as I realized that I had to break them out of the trance that they were in because of what they were seeing in the media, that women lose value as we get older. Yeah. And so I would give them positive suggestions, but actors tend to be very uh, suggestive. So as I was giving them the suggestions, my subconscious mind was taking in the suggestions as well. And I had to live my truth. I can't tell someone, this is it, go for the gusto, you can do anything, if I'm not doing that myself. So I stopped becoming a hypnotherapist, I gave up that career, and I went back to acting. And I'm a writer, so I started writing sketches and with uh, Iona Morris, I wrote uh, a show with Iona Morris and Lola Love. We did a sketch show called Herotica. That was my first uh, sketch show. And then Iona and I did a show called Moist. And all of the shows that I've done in some way had to do with changing the paradigm on women and aging. Because can I interrupt you for a second? What what age do you, did you start to move into hypnotherapy? Like, what age were the people, the women that were coming to you? They were in their mid forties. They yeah. were in their mid forties. Real and interestingly enough, some of the women who would come to see our show would be in their thirties. I live in Los Angeles. Thirty year old women are, are terrified. If if a woman hits thirty and she's not married and she doesn't have the career that she wants, they get a little scared because they think, oh my God, is life over for me? What am I going to do? It is a scary proposition. And the thing about it is that we as women have to give value to ourselves before anyone will appreciate us. So that's kind of my, my motto. And that's my message to all women. You appreciate yourself first and then others will appreciate you. Right. And I did watch some of your stand-up on YouTube. It's uh, it's got a, a nice a sexual undertone, some of it, <laughs> which I thought was really fun. I, I I really like enjoyed it. I was like going down the rabbit hole of your YouTube channel, watching stuff, and it it was really cool. And it's nice to see women that are not twenty years old making jokes and talking about all this stuff, because you know we're not drying up and we're not you know, withering away as women. And so it's, it's really refreshing. So what was the natural progression after you shut down the hypnotist, hypnotist career and um, hypnotherapist, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's okay. Um, let's see. I stopped probably around the age of 50, say 55-ish. 
And I mean, a lot of life happened along the way. I got a divorce. My, both of my parents died. I became at various times caretakers for them. So that took a little chunk, you know, little detours from life. Right. Um, but I started doing the theater and I continued to audition for commercials and things like that. I mean, I still would get roles like that. But I moved from LA. I moved back to New York to take care of my mom. Um, then I ended up going to Chicago, which is where I was from originally. Uh, and my sister and I were both diagnosed with cancer. And oh. so we were there to get us through that. And, and, and I even turned that into stand up. You know, I had a, I had uterine cancer, so I had a full hysterectomy. And I just say, you know, it's like getting an internal Brazilian. If you're going to landscape the runway, why not declutter the terminal? <laughs> um, and in, even in that, a lot of women who, who had had cancer came up to me afterwards. And, you know, as a gender, women tend to carry a lot of shame. You know, so cancer especially something that affects our, our our female organs you know breast cancer uterine cancer women carry a lot of shame am i less of a woman the, the loss of my hair with the loss of a breast whatever and i'm about saying you are more than your body parts and so that's pretty much my message that's what really keeps me going as an actor i just think you know, God probably said, you, you got a big mouth. Yes, I want you to go and you'll be the one. You spread the word. And so that's what I do. So you've been in The Blacklist, too. We've watched that show quite yeah. a bit. Um, so I was surprised to, to see that you were in that, too. Like, I was just, every time I would, like, look at something, I was like, oh, my gosh, she was in this and she did this. And I with stand-up shows and the, all the kind of stuff. It's, to me, it's very exciting because it's a whole different world than I'm used to. But, and something you said to me resonated when we spoke privately was that you felt like there was like three acts to women's lives, not just, you know, uh, being younger and then being older, but that you could do things um, over a certain age, you could reinvent yourself. And there's no limit on that kind of thing. Well, the thing about it is that we shouldn't fall into the trap of trying to be who we were. Don't think of yourself as an older version of what you once were. When I turned 60, I thought, wow, this is, I've never been old before. I thought, well, this is something interesting. And I entered my 60s with curiosity. It's like, oh, hmm, it's like going to another country. What are, the, what are the culture? What are the norms here? What, how, how do things work here? You know, do you have to change? Do the people here eat differently? What's going on here in, the, in this uh, land of the 60s? And I really approached it that way. And I think if you look at life just in general with uh, curiosity uh, and uh, optimism, and even if you don't have optimism, if you're just curious, you can be negative and curious, like, what the hell is this? It just be curious. <laughs> that will keep you going. Yeah, so then what, what made you move to the stage then? What made you move to stand-up comedy? That's got to be very different than, you know, even being in plays. Or well, in all honesty, because uh, stand-up comedy was not really on my radar, except that when I moved to New York, my mom was living with my sister and they lived on Long Island and my mom was not in really good shape. So I could not audition or do anything or leave my mom alone in the house. I had to be there with her. So I was her daytime caretaker. And when my sister came home from work, I'd get on the train and go back into the city <laughs> and I did stand-up comedy because well what do people do late at night I started I took a class at um, uh, Caroline's with Linda Smith I took a class at Caroline's in stand-up comedy and I made my stand-up debut there at Caroline's and the first time I went on stage as a stand-up it was terrifying because as a stand-up you're really yourself you're not being able, you're not able to hide behind a character and you 
audiences want you to be authentic. So it feels like you're exposing a lot of yourself. But when you do that, you connect with the audiences. So I was in New York. It was a year before my, my mom passed. And that's really, that's really what got me to stand up because that was the only avenue of showbiz that was open to me was late night comedy clubs because I was caretaking my mom during the day. I would have like literally, like I think I would just shit my pants if I was trying to get up on stage to do comedy, you know? So I'm so in awe of you, you know? Um, but it must've been terrifying to get up there and put yourself out there, jokes that you wrote and what if they're not funny and what they are, like what goes through your head the first moment that you step up on the stage? Well, uh, the first time I stepped on stage, I was absolutely honest with the audience. I said, you know, I'm used to being on a TV set where you have your own dressing room and they pay a lot of money. And I said, but I'm old now. And so now I'm here doing stand up. And I said, and you know what? This shit is hard. <laughs> And the pay is not nearly as good. And I said, somebody give me another show. But um, I think the, uh, the attitude and the appreciation for older women has, has changed in the enter entertainment industry, which is why I'm back in Los Angeles. I have a new agent. I did my solo show here uh, this spring, and the reception was so good so positive that i decided oh, i think I'm, i can come back to la and take another shot at this because somebody's somebody's got to represent and you know there's a show on i'm gonna give a plug for the show because i watched it the other night and i thought it was cute uh the cool kids with vicky lawrence and uh leslie jordan david allen greer and martin mall it takes place in a retirement home and i thought oh a retirement home this is not going to be good it's going to be old people jokes and I watched it and it was absolutely adorable. These are some feisty little, it's almost like a, they have their own little our gang comedy going, except it's in a retirement home. It's really a funny, adorable little show. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to watch it. The Cool Kids, it's called. Yeah, The Cool Kids. I think it comes on, it comes on Fox on Friday nights. It comes on after... Um, it comes on after, I don't know, but it's on I'll Friday nights. <laughs> Everything I watch now is on PVR, so I'll just search it and tape it or tape it or whatever it's called now. <laughs> yeah, everything I watch is on Netflix pretty much or, yeah. or, or and, and I, actually everything I, I watch MSNBC a lot. I don't watch a lot of television, um, a lot of, uh. And I don't watch reality TV at all, except for the competition shows. I love So You Think You Can Dance. I love The Voice because I see all of this young talent and I connect with them. And they're, you know, they're just oozing with passion for what they're doing. And I just, I just eat that up. I just love watching the young people with, you know, pursuing their careers. I just, I root for them. I sit there and I cry that all their stories. It's, it's, that's the best TV for me. I, um, as you know, I was in Los Angeles and I didn't get a chance to have a coffee with you like I had hoped I would, but I was staying at the Lowe's Hotel and all of the top 10 people from America's Got Talent were staying there. And I felt like such a mom, you know, because I'm in there and I'm like hugging this guy. He was, the, I don't know if you watched the show at all, but it, his name was Brian King, I think, and he played the violin. Uh, or the fiddle, and um, he was just amazing, and he was telling me about, like, he said, I just, I never knew what surreal meant until I got here, and now I know what it means. I don't even know what's happening to me. I'm out of my body. Things are happening, you know. He was just like, he couldn't even articulate how exciting and awesome that this experience was for him, and he did get cut from the show, but, you know, that experience will obviously propel his life in ways he never thought could happen i'm sure so so it was a, a really a, a treat for me actually to get to meet such a, a young passionate guy and, and he was just yeah. for it. i love that taking well, that, thank you you know 
actors, creative people, there's some urge that makes them have to create. And you create whether, whether anybody's going to pay attention to it or not. But for him to have his talent now in front of an audience, and for, you know what they say, if a tree falls in the middle of a wood, in the woods, and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, now he's got uh, a whole bunch of people in the woods listening to him and appreciating his talent. There's, a, there's an energy between the performer and the audience. It's palpable. And, and the, the performer needs the audience and the, uh, as much as the audience needs entertainment from the performer. Wow. I had to look him up on YouTube. And, and when I saw him in action, I was just like, holy mackerel, he is something else. So anyway, I know what you mean by those talent shows. It's so cool to see people, you know, live in their dream. That's for sure. So what are you up to now? Well, right now, like I said, I'm in Los Angeles. I am auditioning. I'm doing, um, Oh, for anybody in LA who's watching, I'm doing a show at uh, Vitello's on October 25th. Let me see, I have a card here. I have a promo card. I'm going to find it. I'm going <laughs> to find it. I'm going to find it. Yes, here we go. Here we go. This is it. Can you see this? Laura Tate. Yes. This is one of my uh, best friends from New York. We've known each other for well, she doesn't want me to say how long we've known each other, but it's been a long time. <laughs> um, and she is a fabulous singer. And uh, she's, she, she's based in, in um, Dallas right now. And so she's coming to L.A. and she's doing her show. She's got a great band. They played with Steely Dan and Etta James and Bonnie Raitt. She's got a really great band, about six, six or seven pieces and so I'm going to open for her. I'm going to do stand-up comedy. I'm going to open. And we've always wanted to work together. So, you know, we're, we're going to do it now. So that's, what I'm, that's coming up on October the 25th. And I just started um, a video blog that I call Boomer Chick Confidential. And I don't know quite what I'm going to do with it yet, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to speak my truth and speak my heart. And I'm auditioning. I'm auditioning. Oh, I have a solo show that uh, if you go to my website, actually the website for the show is blessedandsexy.com. The name of the show is Occupy Your Vagina. It's a metaphor. It's not that racy, but sometimes people go like, what? I don't know about that name. But how I got the name was when I was living in New York, um, the second time when I went back to New York after my mom had passed and I was living in, I was subletting an apartment in the Wall Street area and I would come out of my apartment and I would see these people carrying these Occupy signs. And I thought, I'm a feminist. Occupy your vagina. That's right, women. Do that. It's a metaphor or not. But, you know, it's about women's empowerment. That's, that's right. my thing. Um, because I'm, you know, I'm 70 years old. I am, I'm in the forefront of, come on, babes, it's going to be fine. So that's my job. You know, I'm the, I'm the mama duck <laughs> who's, who's, who's trying to lead the way for all the little ducklings coming behind and knowing, you know, trying to blaze a trail so that they know it will be all right when they get here. You look amazing for 70. Well, you, you know, amazing. black don't crack. Did we discuss that? I mean, no, I have a lot of, of my that, you know. <laughs> but I also believe I think, <laughs> there's a there's a movie called What the Bleep uh, with Marley Maitland, and there in it there are a lot of interviews with scientists, biologists, and there's a little animated section where they show how cells develop and how the neuropeptides that go into the cells, and our emotions create. The chemistry have an effect on the chemistry of the cells of the of, as you're producing. So if you're depressed, your cells are going to be a little off kilter and a little dysfunctional, and they're going to affect your body. You know, your thoughts and your mind will affect you, and your emotions will affect your body. So I always say that happy cells are pretty cells. So <laughs> I try to keep myself happy. <laughs> I'll take your word for it because I'm trying to keep myself happy all the time too. There, there you go. 
I and you am, look lovely, darling. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up now because I feel like we're getting close to the time where Zoom's going to cut me off anyway. So, okay. um, but I so enjoyed doing this and I hope that we can do it again, maybe in six months or so and we can catch up again. And uh, hopefully by then I'll be on a show and we can talk about that. Uh, maybe I'll just come back to LA because I have to say in closing, I think that Hollywood would not have been on my top, say 50 places to travel in this world. Uh -huh. I went there for a conference and I have to say I had the best time. The weather was gorgeous. The people were fun. The atmosphere was amazing. I stayed at the Lowe's hotel. My conference was at the Dolby center where they have the Oscars. I mean, it couldn't have been any more glitzy. So I will get back there ASAP, I know. Okay, then we got a date. And then we'll have a date. We'll go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marianne. I appreciate your time and sharing it with us. And I'm going to post this recording on my Facebook and I'll tag you in it and you can post it on yours. You're welcome, Tressa, and thank you for asking me. You're very welcome. Okay, bye bye. No shit. No shit. That's where we met. <laughs> <laughs>